Yes, sir. Thank you, Jared. Well, it's good to be here in Ina, Illinois. Uh, I didn't really know where that was, I guess, until a couple days ago, but uh, here we are. Uh, I'd like to talk to you today about uh, some of the nutrient values of, of cover crops. If, if you've been using cover crops, you're well aware that uh, they are extremely high quality products, and we can run into some issues in feeding cover crops and uh, my presentation today is not to try to scare anybody away from using cover crops. I think cover crops are a wonderful feed source, uh, a way we can extend the grazing season and get more grazing days and reduce the cost of production of our uh, uh, raising livestock, we can uh, reduce our feed costs. Every day we have animals grazing and harvesting their own forages, uh, the, the better off we are, I think, as, as livestock producers. Um, I work for Midwest Grass and Forage um, as a forage and grazing specialist, and I also work for Illinois Corn Growers um, at, and their z -Maze Foundation as a cover crop specialist. Uh, actually, I'm a recycled extension uh, person um, after 34 years with uh, University of Illinois Extension. So that's kind of my, my background. And uh, there's a lot of reasons why um, we need to uh, utilize cover crops, I think. Um, they are extremely high quality forages and that's that's one of the reasons we look at them. We can extend the grazing season, um, reduce our feed costs, we can allow the animals to do the harvesting which uh, saves us labor. We have them out on the field so it reduces our uh, manure uh, handling and so forth. And it's an easy way to see the value of cover crops. Uh, you know a lot of people say can cover crops really pay and uh, make it worthwhile for me. And I think if we feed them to livestock, that is a, certainly an easy way to see a value uh, for using cover crops. And then you get some of the other additional benefits of utilizing cover crops uh, when we're when doing the feeding. Um, at any time, if you have questions here, um, We'll, we'll take a minute and try to answer the questions. Uh, I'll find somebody in the room that knows the answer. So uh, it, it may not be me, but we have a lot of uh, bright people out there. So uh, one of the things, as I mentioned, with, with cover crops, we can have some feeding issues that, that we want to prevent. And uh, that's, that's the main goal of this presentation, I think, is to uh, reduce the problems of feeding cover crops and uh, we can do that generally by uh, not allowing real rapid changes in feed quality and letting the rumen microbes adjust to the new high quality feed. You know in the fall when we're feeding cover crops we often have very well used pastures or maybe some poor quality hay that we're feeding and uh, we go right from that dump them out into a lush field of cover crops and that's where our problems begin so if we can avoid those quick changes now a little bit on forage quality and this this may not uh, you may have you may uh, not completely agree with my summarization here but uh, if we look at crude protein, excellent is somewhere above 18%, average is 12 to 18%, and below 12% is low quality. Okay, this is just general uh, summarization here. We have a, uh, acid detergent fiber. We want values that are, you know, uh, the lower uh, the number, the better they are. Uh, Neutral detergent fiber, we're going to look at that a little more closely. That we can use as a, a guide to the bulkiness or how much an animal can really consume. And, and we want values, you know, be, below 40 for excellent 
extremely high quality forage. And I think as you can see, on, does everybody have handouts for this presentation? There were some out there. If you don't, I have some up here. And Kendall, maybe you can help out if somebody needs them. Uh, has the presentation and some other things that might, and a chart with nutrient values that might uh, uh, help explain what I'm talking about here. Uh, relative feed value is a term that we can use to compare different types of forages. You know, uh, say this forage is better than this forage. Uh, relative feed value is actually an index number and 100 is full bloom alfalfa hay, okay? Is full bloom alfalfa hay a uh, very good feed stuff? It's kind of really average quality. So everything is based on that, and as we increase from there, the forage quality gets better. Now, here's why NDF is important neutral detergent fiber. If we expect an animal to gain or to uh, uh, consume 3% of its body weight in forage dry matter uh, or an 1100 pound cow, I'm sorry, we don't have many 1100 pound cows anymore. Uh, okay, this 1100 pound calf, uh, anyway, if we want them to consume 3% of their body weight or 33 pounds of, of forage dry matter a day to meet their nutritional needs, uh, we have to have an NDF of less than 40, okay? If we come in here and have a feedstuff that is, uh, say, 55 NDF, they are going to be able to consume about to 2.2 percent of their body weight. If we need to get them to consume 3 percent to meet their nutritional needs, what's going to happen? We're going to have open cows, thin cows, maybe calves that are dead or weak, uh, maybe no milk. All kinds of things can happen when we don't have enough nutritional value in their feeding program. So, uh, you know, if we have a real poor quality feed, you know, a cow can stick her head in a bale of tall fescue, be the only cow in the lot, and starve to death because she can't physically eat enough of that product, uh, you know, to meet her nutritional needs. So, uh, I think that's one thing that uh, we need to keep in mind. You know, we have a lot of corn residue in Illinois, and we ought to utilize that because it's a good feed stuff. It, it's uh, pretty bulky, but it's not really high quality. Uh, average composition of corn stover, 5% uh, crude protein. We can get corn stover that has, you know, 6.5 or, uh, or better protein, but as we let that weather out in the field, it, uh, boy, don't people have the courtesy to uh, turn their cell phones off before? Forget that. Uh, anyway, uh, the corn plant has uh, uh, different values. You know, the cob's not is 8.2 uh, percent, 48.9 percent grain. But we want to take most of that grain and sell that, uh, even if it is only three dollars and. 50 cents a, a bushel. Uh, but the cows can eat most of the rest of it. But if they're, if you're wanting them to eat stock, 27% of it, uh, it's, it's not very high quality. Uh, so 3% uh, uh, protein. So they're not going to get a lot of good out of that. So we can improve the nutrient value of the corn stover that we have out there in the field by utilizing cover crops. Is that Tom Sachs back there? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> 
Thanks for stopping in. Now bear with me, you have to look at my goats for this next slide here. But uh, wouldn't it be nice to turn your cows out into a lush field of, uh, uh, let's see, this was uh, oats and rape. Ariel seeded into standing corn on September 1, and it was sampled on November 10, had 70 days of growth. Okay, moisture 80, over 80%, uh, crude protein uh, 18 and 23 or 24%, NDF 39 and 24, this is high quality stuff. And if you add that to your poor quality corn stover, you can really uh, have a pretty nice feed out there, but you don't want to take your livestock from a very poor quality feed source and dump them out on here and expect them to do well right off the bat. So you have an extremely high quality feed, you want to manage that correctly. Now there's a, a sheet on here, uh, Illinois Central College had a cover crop plot and uh, I took uh, nutrient values from that plot uh, it was about a 90 day growth period, okay? Now what I want to say about forage testing is you really have to use forage testing to know what you're feeding, okay? Uh, if, you, if you test your hay in the barn, you know, that forage quality is not going to change a lot in, in your feeding period. Uh, it, it's, you know, your, your different cuttings of hay may change, uh, but once you test those, it's going to be pretty much constant. I'm not saying you can leave it there for three years and it'll be the same value, but for this year's feeding period, it's pretty much going to be the same thing. Now you take a cover crop, on the other hand, you probably want to test this as close to the feeding period as you can, because what you sample this week is going to be a lot different than next week. The thing about forage quality is that as we let the crop go to maturity, the value, feeding value changes drastically and it goes down. So uh, the more vegetative the crop is, the higher the value. Elton? I don't think significantly. Uh, one thing you can do is you can put it in a freezer overnight and ship it. Yeah, and if, if you're if you're within driving distance to a lab, if it's an hour away, I'd drive it. And uh, most labs, once they get it, you they'll email you back within 24 hours if if you ask them to. So that's probably the, the best way to get that information back in a, in a good short manner. Yes, sir. Paper bags. Good point. Right. Good point. Uh, now with this with this uh, handout here, 
you know, we see we have very high moisture, very high protein, very low NDF, and uh, so these are very good quality products for feeding and need to be managed accordingly. Um, if we go back to that, uh, the, the upper, um, you know, this is not replicated data. It is uh, just one point, one time. It's a snapshot. Uh, these are unfertilized plots that were just planted into an area of grass sod. The ones on the bottom were planted in a crop corn soybean rotation, so the fertility level was higher there. You can see that we do, in general, have uh, uh, protein values that are higher because of the increased nitrogen that was used in, in that. Uh, so if we look at relative feed values, we said 100 was like full bloom alfalfa hay. Uh, 370, whoo, that's hot stuff. Okay, we talk about cover crops, cool season annuals. These are grass, and, and I apologize, I didn't have every species that I'm going to talk about on that chart. For one thing, we didn't plant every species in that plot. The other thing is, I didn't have enough money to do all these forage samples, so uh, that's the story there. But cereal rye, wheat, triticale, oats, uh, spring oats, winter oats, barley, spring and winter varieties, annual rye grass, all of them can have very high quality uh, feed. It can be used as a protein supplement. You know, you don't have to purchase as much protein because you have very high quality protein in these, uh, in these products. Now one thing that can be a problem when you have uh, grasses like this that are this quality, grass tetany. Okay, now the easy way to uh, control uh, grass tetany is to put some magnesium oxide in your mineral mix. That's going to take care of that uh, issue. Bloat potential. You say, well, bloat, that's legumes. That's clovers, alfalfa, and so forth. Well, whenever you have extremely high quality feed, like these grasses, they can cause bloat as well. Quality increases consumption. So animals that are offered an extremely high quality product will consume more. You know, if you like chocolate, you might consume more than you want to uh, or need to. But uh, yeah, need to. That, it's not, you might want to consume more, but it's going to make you sick. Same thing happens here. Um, you can get bloat, and probably the most effective bloat control is polyxylene bloat guard blocks before you're uh, turning animals out into a, a lush situation or a uh, bloat situation. It's an anti-foaming agent in the rumen, so you don't get the foaming and you don't get the cut off of the air. So uh, keep that in mind. Uh, extremely high quality feeds with high uh, protein, you can get some, uh, run into some breeding problems, high blood urea nitrogen levels. You can reduce that by also offering some poor quality forages, poor quality forages that they can kind of tend to balance out uh, their needs. Okay, uh, so we take those off the chart, uh, the grasses, uh, very high moisture, high protein, low NDF. What does that tell you? Okay, it uh, tells you don't stand too close behind the cow. Whoosh. Really rapid movement through the digestive tract. Uh, so we really need to slow that down a little bit. Um, and allow them to utilize more of those nutrients. So if we 
uh, or putting this into corn residue, that's a good place to add some poor quality feed to mix with that high quality feed and it will uh, feed much better. Grass tetany, you don't want to see animals laying on their side kicking, uh, so you want to avoid that. And once again, magnesium oxide, uh, <coughs> it is a magnesium deficiency. It usually happens in high potassium, high protein pastures above 25% crude protein. So um, if you have cover crops, you're, you're going to approach 25% crude protein. Uh, so you want to avoid grass tetany. Uh, also nutritional stress, weather stress, lactation uh, increases the chance of, of grass tetany. Uh, all of those grasses, um, we can go through symptoms and treatment, but I don't want to worry about that. I want to worry about prevention. That's the easy thing to do. You spend less money with prevention than treatment. Uh, so magnesium oxide in the mineral mix. Easy fix. Forage legumes. Annual legumes, we have a lot of different legumes out there now that are being utilized for cover crops uh, or for forage crops. And uh, anytime we utilize legumes, I shouldn't say anytime, most every time we use legumes, we have a chance of bloat. There are some non bloating legumes that we can keep in mind. Uh, but we have, again, very high, high moisture, high protein. Uh, low NDF products and a, a problem can be bloat. Um, sweet clover, anybody familiar with yellow blossom sweet clover? Uh, you can run into the same thing as decon rat poisoning there, dicumarol. Uh, you can get some internal bleeding if you have uh, musty sweet clover hay. Uh, usually not a problem if you're grazing it, but if you have, try to put it up for hay, it may not work so well for you, so you want to keep that in mind. Uh, soybeans are a legume. Some folks utilize soybeans in a grazing program. If you have an annual, uh, annual grass planted, you can mix some soybeans with it. Uh, then you have your grass legume mixture. Uh, adds quality, adds protein uh, to your grass. Uh, you might want to use a, like a group seven soybean or something like that and uh, uh, get more forage growth out of it. Now we never want toes up because these toes never come back down. Uh, so bloat is, is an issue, we don't want to have it and it's an accumulation of gas in the rumen. It does cut off the, uh, the foaming of the rumen, cuts off the, the air supply to the animal and uh, Generally, this happens when we're moving animals from a low quality forage to a high quality forage. They overconsume and then they have a, a problem. Um, moving animals when the forage is wet. So if we move to a new pasture in the afternoon, we have less of an issue than we do if we're moving them in the morning. Introduce animals to legumes or high quality <laughs> forages without an adjustment period. You know, we need to let those bugs in the rumen uh, adjust a little bit when we're changing feed quality. So keep that in mind. Uh, any of our legumes, uh, crimson clover, hairy vetch, sweet clover, red clover, alfalfa, and high quality brassicas and uh, grasses can cause bloat due to overconsumption. Okay, so again, we're not going to talk about uh, treatment, prevention, uh, have animals full before they go on to the new forage. You know, we want to adjust them for a few hours, for a couple days, get, get those bugs working. Uh, move animals to new pastures when they're dry. Also, a managed grazing program with smaller paddocks, allowing the animals to consume a higher percentage of the plants that are out there. They get more cell wall, more uh, of, of the coarse material, not just going around picking off the tips, the highest quality 
that's, that's in the pasture. Um, mixed forages rather than legumes or brassicas, we, we want to have about 60% grass and that helps to reduce the bloating issue. Um, and an anti-foaming agent like polyoxaline uh, greatly reduces the, the chance of bloat. And that also gives the rumen some time to adjust uh, to that uh, new type of forage. If we're looking at brassicas, uh, there's a whole bunch of brassicas we can utilize uh, for a feeding program. Turnips, rape, kale, swedes, hybrids of, of the two, two or three, uh, Chinese cabbage, forage radish, a uh, lot of different uh, brassicas out there we can use. I would suggest if you use brassicas that you use a strip grazing program. You, can, uh, you probably can't see this wire, electric wire here, but you can see the change of color between the, the two sides here. Uh, there's a lot of, lot of forage and tops to this forage out here, these turnips, uh, the first day. Second day of grazing, you see a lot of bulbs laying around on the field. And the third day, it kind of looks like a bulldozer went down through there and there's not much left. But uh, that's allocating uh, forage for your cows. Uh, these cows also had access to corn stalks. Um, they were not in the same field, but they, uh, we were stripping the, the, the turnips. Uh, and you can see the, the bulbs actually got pretty good size there. Um, planting date is extremely critical on brassicas. Uh, these pictures were taken of three different planting dates, July 15, August 15, and September 15. Now, I would suggest if you're feeding brassicas that you don't wait to, till February, or till uh, till uh, September 15 to plant them. You want to get them planted as early as possible. So probably what's most practical if you have a wheat field or oats field, that would be a place where you might be able to get them planted in late July. Um, or if you can't get it done till maybe mid-August, find your earliest season corn and fly it onto your standing corn um, at maturity and that will get you a earlier start than waiting till after the corn comes out and it will give you a lot more forage dry matter. What were the planting dates? July 15, August 15 and September 15. Some years we get to September 15 those, turn, those radishes may only get that long if you plant them in the end of July, they may get that deep. Uh, now, as a grazing preference, I would graze turnips rather than radishes because most of that bulb structure on a turnip is above ground and just the tiny little tap root goes down into the ground. Those cows start pushing on those turnips and eating them, they'll pop that tap root out of the ground They can consume the whole plant. Now, with a radish, that's, well, if you get a radish that's that long, probably that much of it is going to be below ground, but the cow's not going to be able to eat that. So that's, to me, a waste of forage. I mean, there's other good things that happen there. It does uh, uh, pull up some nitrogen and unused uh, uh, fertility from your uh, previous crop and uh, recycles it and uh, still has that root where uh, you allow for improved drainage and uh, nutrient circulation and that type of thing. Okay, the brassicas, extremely high quality, just like feeding grain. So you don't want to feed brassicas by themselves. You want to add a grass or some type of fibrous material that, uh, that, that helps balance the diet out a little bit. Um, very high moisture. Again, high protein, low NDF. There's a thing with uh, feeding brassicas we can run into, which is a thiamine enzyme deficiency. And this generally is caused when we're grazing brassicas by themselves without the fibrous uh, 
grass along with them. It's called paleoencephalomalacia. Now, I only say that once because I can't ever get through it the second time. Uh, it is a neurological disease of ruminants. It's a depressed thiamine enzyme activity, all right? Uh, they can also cause bloat, nitrate poisoning, and digestive upsets just due to the extreme high quality that they are. Uh, abrupt changes in feed quality or quantity. Uh, pure brassica stands more than 65 to 75 percent of the diet. Uh, so keep that in mind. What, what species? All the brassicas, turnips, uh, radish, rape, kale hybrids. Now, uh, since we're down in the southern part of the state, uh, SIU, Southern Illinois University, has found that if you utilize uh, rape before soybeans, you can get an increase of two bushel per acre on your soybeans. And, you know, even at 972 or whatever the price is now, uh, that, that's helpful to have 18 more dollars per acre uh, just by utilizing a cover crop. Yeah. I was wondering what you thought about uh, providing access to wheat flow for grass hay and then raising uh, the high quality of the crop. Right? I, I think it's good to offer the access, but you know what happens a lot of times is they eat according to quality. They'll go eat the good stuff and then they'll go back to the good stuff and the hay bale will kind of sit there. But I agree, you should have it there and uh, try to get them to utilize it, but uh, it, it's better to have a grass planted with it that is a fresh forage and the consumption will be better. Okay, again, prevention. Uh, make dietary changes slowly, adjust those rumen bugs again. Uh, have animals full when they go on so they don't overconsume right off the bat. Uh, and have that grass planted with the, the brassicas and uh, strip grazing also helps to reduce problems. Uh, we have a lot of summer annuals out there and one point here is don't wait until those summer annuals are back high on your cattle or you're not going to get very good forage utilization out of it. Uh, we need to adhere to the proper grazing height of, uh, of some of our sedan family uh, plants because we have uh, a greater chance of uh, prussic acid poisoning in the vegetative uh, growth of, of these products. Um, just threw this in here for some annual forage yields. Uh, you need to select a forage whether you want to cut it as a one cut system or a two cut system and your yields and uh, so forth are going to be different. Uh, you'll note that uh, your crude protein can be can increase in a multi cut system and again that's because of maturity. If you just have a one cut system and let it go to maturity, your protein is going to be lower. If you cut it twice or three times, every time you cut it, it goes back to vegetative and it increases the quality. So keep that in mind. Uh, yields of annual forages, uh, you know, there's a big range here and generally our sedans are higher in yield but they're also higher in prussic acid potential. So some people say, well, I just want to avoid that. And if you avoid that, you'll have to recognize that you're giving up yield, but you can still get some pretty good quality in some of these other things, um, but you have a lot lower yield. Prussic acid poisoning. Uh, It's in young or damaged plants. Uh, so this generally happens 
uh, you know, vegetative growth of young plants, drought stunted plants, frosted plants. Uh, frost will damage the plant, uh, damage some cells and cell walls in the plant, and that can uh, trigger prussic acid uh, potential. Uh, high nitrogen fertility can also uh, cause this. So, and if we go back here, uh, all of the sedan family, uh, sorghum, sedans, sedan grass, uh, hybrids, uh, Johnson grass, shatter cane, sorghum almond, nobody has those weeds around there, do you? Uh, wild black cherry trees, we have a lot of those in Illinois. And if you have a, a storm come through and blow down one of those trees, and your animals go consume all the leaves off that tree, they're going to be dead if you don't get them out of there. Um, so that's, that's just one of those things that, dumb things that happens when you farm. Anyway, um, again, prevention is what we want to think about here. Uh, safest in order from left to right, hay, silage, green chop, fresh forage. Okay, uh, safe grazing height, 18 to 24 inches. Let it get that tall before you start grazing. But don't wait till it gets up here. You're going to lose quality and tonnage, and they'll waste more than they eat. Um, remove animals when there's a chance of frost. Watch for tillers and regrowth after a frost. Uh, look for varieties that are low in prussic acid. Sedan grass generally has about 40% less prussic acid potential than the other sedans. So right there you can reduce that. Uh, fill animals before turning in the first time. Um, you know, and, and siling uh, will, uh, you'll lose some of the prussic acid in that process. Uh, um, so, uh, there is no prussic acid in the millets or tough grass. So if you want to avoid that completely, go that way. Remember, you're going to lose yield. OK, fer fertility uh, can affect nitrate, uh, your nitrate level in these plants. and. Uh, just in these uh, cover crops that we took a look at here, nitrate nitrogen parts per million uh, from the unfertilized plot to the more typically fertilized plot, we got increase. Not, not every time, but uh, uh, we're just saying here that fertility, nitrogen fertility can increase the potential for nitrate poisoning. And what is that? Uh, the nitrate concentration, when that exceeds the rumen's ability to convert nitrate to ammonia, um, ammonia and uh, uh, further to amino acids and protein. So it, it doesn't get that breakdown, and you have a buildup there of the, uh, the, the nitrate. Uh, heavy manure can cause that. Uh, or nitrogen fertilized pastures, uh, drought and southern sudden weather changes are also uh, can be problems. And any of the sedan family, pearl millet, foxtail millet, Japanese millet, now oat, cereal rye, barley, triticale, any of the grasses and some grass and broadleaf weeds. You know, your foxtail can cause nitrate poisoning, um, some of your broadleaf weeds. Uh, Again, this is why it's good to occasionally take a test of your forages and know what you're dealing with at the time. An experience that I've often seen with my clients is when they have the had a poor crop. We're coming in behind a less than average crop that was allowed to exist in that other crop behind. Yep. Uh, they'll pick it up. Yep, that's that's correct. Well, that's right. If you have an available fertilizer, uh, and a lot of times that's due to drought. So again, prevention, test your forages. Know what you're dealing with. 
know what nitrate levels affect your livestock. Uh, and siling reduces nitrates 50%. Okay? So if you're using a silage system, you're going to be able to reduce that a certain amount, but what level are you starting at? That's the key issue. Um, you can raise your forage cutter height, leave some of the stalks or stems in the field. That reduces the amount of nitrate that you're putting in the silage. Now, <clears throat> here we go. Depends on whose system you look at. I just pulled two off the internet here. Uh, University of Missouri, they take a, a little more uh, cautious approach. They say it's safe from zero to 550 on nitrate nitrogen, okay? And that's the column you're looking at on those forages there in the test. Uh, University of Nebraska says less than a thousand is safe for everything. Okay, I kind of like to use the Nebraska because it's easy to remember. Less than a thousand safe for everything. Thousand to two thousand basically is safe for non-pregnant animals, and you can adapt non-pregnant animals slowly and mix the uh, with uh, low nitrate feeds. Uh, two thousand to three thousand. You can only use as 50% of the feed source. Um, and uh, over 3390, limit to 25% of the feed source. Uh, Did you just mention the, your feed pool expression nitrate under nitrate added nitrate? Yeah, this is nitrate uh, parts per million, and this is nitrate nitrogen parts per million. So there's two different that's a thing to look at on your test. Make sure which test is being reported on your your uh, your forage test, and then look at a chart that gives you the numbers that compare with what you have on your chart. I just threw that in there to show that there are two different expressions of nitrate. Okay, so we have these cover crops. We really need to use them. They're high quality feeds. Uh, we need to know that there are some potential problems out there, but we also can know that we can avoid those problems through good management. Uh, we need to avoid abrupt changes in feed quality. We need to fill the animals with hay prior to uh, access to high quality forages. Mix grass or fiber with legumes and brassicas you know, at least 60%, and provide uh, proper mineral supplementation while the animals are grazing. Um, use managed grazing, smaller paddocks, make, force the animals to eat more of the entire plant rather than cherry picking their favorites out of the field. Uh, adjust the rumen microbes um, over several days to dietary changes, and have a good veterinary client patient relationship so that if you run into a problem your vet knows what you're dealing with and uh, knows your potential problems can treat it quickly any questions yes sir on the, the dan grass on the sacrifice a lot so you've been feeding hay high moisture manure that's the real problem uh, with that well, it's a it's a potential for nitrate poisoning. It's not necessarily a, a prussic acid problem. Right. That's what I meant on nitrate. Uh, you recommend some other some kind of rye or something? Or any of the grasses, any of the grasses can be a potential problem. I would recommend testing. And and if you have a high level of nitrate, you need to dilute that feed down to a level that is safe to feed. So, so if you run it in and out, uh, say like put it up for about an hour and pull it back out, you're able to do that on the paddock. Uh, you know, unless it's extremely high, you guys probably be okay with doing that. Yeah, you I've could. I've done that before. I haven't had a problem. Yep. But you kind of got my interest on that. Uh, I thought I'd rather run 
brought in for about an hour or two, pulled them out, and it seemed to work. Uh, I think you can do that. You have to have that other feed source to, to yeah. blend in there. As long as they're eating it. They're eating the other food. Yeah, they're right. Be eating it. Well, right. I had, I had them on hay, and I fed just a little bit of uh, dry corn, brown mm -hmm. corn, mm -hmm. and it seemed that I didn't have a problem. Now, I put them on a regular grass pasture uh, afterwards. It seemed like they really weren't loose. They were doing pretty good on that. Now, my second question, 18 inches absolute minimum height to graze them on first stand grass. And, but, I mean, if you get up to three or four feet, they're still, they're losing, but that's still better than you safe to start. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And in a dry weather, do we need to raise that a little bit on that? Because I noticed you were talking about that acid. What we need to do here is not have them on long. Um... I'm not not sure I understand. Well, like what's that 2012 turned off dry? Yeah, sure did. Uh, I had the sort of banana grass, and I really limited. I mean, like an R, and I pulled them off of because I was worried about that acid. Or, or, I always heard the dry weather really brings that out, like you're you're telling me. Well, then the nitrates will be more of a problem in dry weather than prussic acid. Prussic acid. Okay, so you were asking a question. I didn't know which one. Yeah. And and that's that's what we say again. Test the forage right. so you know what you're dealing with. Yes, sir, Robert. Quick uptake. Yep. Any anything else? 